coal stand. Please be seated. Yes, Ms. Finnett. Uh, thank you, Your Honour. Uh, I call Bishop Paul Bird. Bishop, will you take it over from the Bible? I will. Yes. Would you take the Bible in your hand, please? And repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Yes, thank you. Take a seat. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Finnes. Thank you, Your Honour. Tell the Royal Commission your full name and occupation. Paul Bernard John Bird, and uh, I'm a bishop, a Catholic bishop of Ballarat. Yeah. You've made two statements, um, Bishop. The first date of the 11th of May 2015. Right. Are the contents of that true and correct? They are, yes. I tender that statement. That'll become Exhibit 2835. You've made a further statement dated the 27th of May. Yes. The contents yes. of that statement true and correct? They are. Yes. I tender that statement. That'll be 2836. Uh, you have been the Bishop of Ballarat since the 16th of October 2012? That's correct, yes. What, what position did you hold before that? I was provincial of the Redemptorist congregation in Australia. Yeah. That a congregation that operates in each state and you were provincial of all Redemptorists in Australia, is that right? It operates in several states. Yeah, and are there in that order? Uh, in Australia, 70, around 70 members, yeah. Now, since you've uh, been Bishop of Ballarat, what uh, inquiries have you made to understand the extent of the offending that's occurred in the Catholic Diocese of Ballarat? It was very uh, early in my time. Uh, we actually were... Um, Coming to the Victorian inquiry into um, institutional responses to sexual abuse, and that meant that uh, I, within the first few months of my time, um, I was looking at the records that we have in our diocese about a uh, very sad history uh, in the Ballarat Diocese of offences. I had earlier times as a Redemptorist Provincial um, been concerned about that and before that even I became provincial in 2008 but before that of course these uh, problems had been uh, become much more well known and so it was over those earlier years and then during my time as provincial and then perhaps most of all uh, in my first few months as a bishop of Ballarat that I saw the extent of the, uh, um, the offences in the Ballarat diocese. Yeah. You referred to these problems, I take it by problems, you mean crimes? Yes, yes. yes. When did you first understand that it was a crime to sexually abuse a child? I think I would have always understood that, yeah. Do you ever see it as a moral failing rather than a crime? Not rather than, as well as... Uh, as well as a crime, you see it as a moral failing? Sure, yeah. What's the consequences for a person in the clergy or in uh, an order... Uh, who fails morally? The, uh, if it's a public failing, uh, then there would be public consequences. If, uh, if it's not public, uh, then the uh, consequences might be uh, well, less public. Uh, I'm sure I don't understand that. No. Okay. Uh, let's, let's say a uh, moral failing might be dishonesty, for example. Um, a person might be dishonest uh, even in, towards their confreres in the community. Um, and that no doubt would have its impact on the, on the community. They might realise their dishonesty and, uh, and, as it were, repent of that and improve in the future. Um, um, so. Can I... Explore this a little more. Sure. You say that you've always considered the sexual abuse of a child to be a crime. Yes. Um, I've heard other church people 
say that in times past it was seen as a moral failing but not a crime. Have you heard church people speak in those terms? I've heard people talk about it in that way, but that wasn't my, that's not my uh, understanding. Uh, well, is there a view or was there a view abroad in the church that abusing a child was a moral issue and not a criminal issue? Well, I, I wasn't aware of that view. I know it's been put by some people in recent times, um, but I, I don't share that view. Well, you, you say you know it's been put by some people. What, what people? Uh, a, a level at a, at a high level in the church? I'm referring really to uh, newspaper articles where this is discussed, uh, that people would distinguish between moral uh, failing and a crime, but I would think, my, in my view, a crime would, oh, would certainly be a moral failing. Not all moral failings are crimes, though. A moral failing is a, a failure to act um, as we should as human beings uh, that might not be uh, against the criminal code of a country. Much of my understanding of this discussion, like you, comes from newspaper reports, but um, uh, do you, from your, or have you in your own experience, um, when speaking with bishops and others in senior positions about these issues, had it put to you that the church got it wrong because we only ever saw it as a moral failing? Not personally. Nobody has put that to me. But I, I have read it in articles. Yeah. And in reading it in articles, you're an insider to this, you're inside the mm. church. But uh, should we understand that there has been a significant view in the church that these issues were moral and not criminal? I couldn't answer that, really. I, I haven't come across that as a, as a significant uh, point of view in the church. What uh, about at the Bishops' Conference, which no doubt you attend? Have mm -hmm. these issues been talked about there? They have, yes, yes. And, and uh, I, are bishops, some bishops inclined to describe them as moral and not criminal issues? I wouldn't say, no, I haven't heard that, that they're moral and not criminal. I would uh, have heard their moral uh, failings, their moral offences, and also criminal. Also criminal. In the uh, work you did to understand the extent of offending in this diocese for the purposes of the Victorian inquiry, what was the earliest occasion of offending that you discovered? Uh, they would have been in the uh, 1960s. I'd, I'd have to, again, check the dates, but that would be my general recollection. Nothing uh, in the 50s? Uh, not that I... Sorry, there, there may have been in later. I didn't look at all the, the, uh, uh, the records at that time, just before the commission, but that's true, there are some that go back to the 50s. Yeah. What records did you look at to understand the extent of the offending? Uh, they were the, uh, the records of uh, those who had come forward um, as uh, ones who had been abused. And uh, so we, I looked through those in general, not able, though, to read all of them, so you mean the complaints that were made? made? Yes, and the history of how they were responded to. And what yeah. documents did you have regard to that told you the history of how they were responded to? Well, I'm referring basically to the file of, of each person's uh, history, that when the complaint was made, what response initially was made, and then how, how that unfolded, um, in most cases, to a resolution... Uh, so that, in a way, gave the history of each person's uh, complaint and the response. Yeah. Now, complaints started to be made in the late 80s and then 90s, mm -hmm. that's right? That's correct, yes. What records did you look at of the church before complaints were made? I, I didn't look at records before, um, speaking of records of complaints, yeah. So you haven't looked at the records held by the church at the time the offending was happening, that is mainly 60s, 70s and 80s? 
only records there really are the records of the personnel, so they they would cover those years. Yeah, so the for example, a particular priest looking at his personnel record might take you from the fifties through the sixties and seventies and so on. That was part of the response of the diocese to a claim. Was there records of the priest, the subject of the claim, going back to their ordination and before? Uh, yes, they were, they were looked at. I looked at those as well. So you looked at them in the context of the claims? I did. So if I was looking at the claims, um, I think it was the other, um, other side of that, in a sense, the, the history of the priest who was accused. Yeah. Did you uh, look to any minutes of meetings to determine what was done with priests and what discussions there were about priests? Uh, no, I didn't look at minutes of meetings at that stage, no. When you say at that stage, have you ever? I certainly I've looked at minutes of meetings, uh, maybe particularly in preparation for the Royal Commission. We've been asked to produce those. The documents you produced to the Royal Commission in relation to minutes of meetings and matters that occurred in the 60s and 70s, was it the only time or the first time you looked at them for the purpose of producing them to the Royal Commission? No, I would have uh, occasionally looked back on for different points about the diocese's history. Leaving yeah. aside the diocese's history and specifically having regard to offending in the diocese, did you have regard to any records held by the diocese that weren't specifically complaint related to understand the nature of the offending? I'm sorry, I didn't really follow the full the question. The is that you looked at complaints that were made and then how the diocese handled those complaints and as part of those records were records of the priest, the subject of the complaints. Mm -hmm. That's right? Correct. I'm yes. asking whether you looked at records held by the diocese other than those in relation to understanding more about offending? Uh, no. No, I didn't look at other records. Uh... The um, minutes that have been tendered before the Royal Commission and the evidence that has been given about them, uh, are they matters that you have understood for the first time, the relationship between those minutes and offending and moving priests? Uh... I'm not sure uh, whether it's uh, just fuller picture that I've got at the moment, but I suppose I always recognise that the minutes would be referring to uh, transfers or moves, moves of priests and appointments in different uh, parishes. Um, Bishop, uh, <clears throat> have you ever been involved in discussions about destruction of documents in the diocese in relation to abusing priests? I haven't. Have you heard of discussions between church people about the potential destruction of documents? Uh, the only reference I, there I've heard was uh, that uh, Bishop Mal Kearns had uh, destroyed some medical records. Uh, well, um, it would seem from the documents that we have that at least the position in America uh, at the treating facility was that medical reports should be destroyed mm -hmm. or returned to that facility. But there's also a suggestion that documents that might be embarrassing might be uh, sent to the papal nuncio or ambassador um, so as to be kept away from civil authorities. Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of that, no. no. Now, um, there has been a discussion in Australia about advice being given in relation to the destruction of documents. But you say you've never encountered that I've discussion? I've never encountered that discussion, no. no. Mm -hmm. The inquiries that you made for the purposes of the Victorian inquiry were to look at the response of the diocese to individual complaints mm -hmm. as they were made. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Correct, yes. Have you looked at the records held by the diocese to understand the response of the diocese when the offending was occurring? No, I haven't, no. For example, you mean if it might, the offending might have been occurring in the 50s and did I look, oh, I haven't looked around that historical period, no. 
Do you think you need to understand what the diocese did in the 50s, 60s and 70s when the offending occurred in order to properly make good to the people of Ballarat what happened then? I think the, the history of the response would usually include when I referred to the history uh, or the file uh, of documents in relation to a particular complaint, if there were anything specifically that came from earlier years, that was usually included there. But there wasn't any... Uh, um, I didn't do any other looking at the general history of the period. Bishop, um, um, it may help everyone if you can just help me. Do you keep or does a bishop keep a personnel file on each individual clergy? Well, I do, yes, yes. And is that the tradition for all bishops? Uh, I would imagine so. I, I'm not sure of all, but uh, I would think it's a, a very correct or proper and very helpful thing to do. Uh, and do you keep or do the files reveal a record of complaints about the individual priest if the complaints have been made? Uh, they do, yes. yes. And do they uh, reveal the bishop's response? the way the bishop handled the complaint on the personnel file? Uh, that's usually in the particular f complaint file. Not, on the... not, not in the personnel file. So the personnel file doesn't record what the bishop or whoever might have done about the priest's alleged offending? No, that would be uh, stored in the file which... Uh, and gives the history of their particular complaint. Uh, it would be usual in relation to the management of personnel that the personnel file would show the good and the bad, wouldn't it? I, I suppose so, but the two together will give the full story. Yeah. Making the assumption that you can go from the personnel file to the complaint file. Yes. Now, um, when the complaints come in, uh, is it expected that a bishop would report the fact that a complaint has been received to any other church authority? Uh, the, well, to take the procedure for uh, towards healing, which has been used for quite a few years. I know, I'm not so concerned about the response to the survivor. What about the response of the church to the uh, offending of the, or well, alleged offending of the priest? Is there any obligation on the bishop to tell anyone else in authority in the church what's been reported in relation to the particular priest? Oh, yes, in relation to the priest, uh, the, uh, the bishop is required to report that to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And how do you do that? What, by what process? By a letter, uh, sent, letter sent through the Apostolic Nuncio uh, to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And is a copy of that letter kept on the personnel file? Yes, yes. And is that the case in relation to all of the offenders that you have looked at? Or the uh, it's, looked at? it's not, because that's, as far as I'm aware, that's a relatively new requirement that for each complaint a, uh, a notification would be sent to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. So I don't have records in the, when the earlier, say in the 90s, that um, those notifications were made. Have you ever notified anyone? I have, yes. How many? Uh, just of the one case, which was quite recent. Yeah. Right. When there was a recent conviction. Yeah. Yes, right. Do you get a response back from the uh, nuncio or from Rome when you send... A letter? Yes, with me, my limited experience, I have a, just basically so far an acknowledgement from both of receiving um, my, my letter. And what do you understand you will hear in due course from them about the offending that you've referred to them? Well, in um, that case, I was kind of concluded my letter asking uh, for advice or direction about any further action to be taken, because in that case I had uh, taken the faculties away from the priest and asked the congregation for any advice or direction about further action against the priest. If the priest was to be laicised, 
Is that something that's initiated in Rome or initiated by you here? Uh, it, it would be initiated uh, by probably most cases by the priest himself um, uh, and if it were uh, to be initiated when the priest is not willing to be laicized, uh, it would involve the, myself um, <coughs> writing to the congregation for the doctrine of the faith uh, to request that uh, laicization be imposed on the person. Have you been in that position? Uh, not yet. I have spoken with the Apostolic Nuncio about one case which is quite old um, and uh, uh, I haven't f completed that process. That hasn't been completed yet. But Would you expect to get from Rome uh, reasons for its decision, whatever that decision might be, in respect of a priest? Again, I haven't had too many documents from Rome personally. Uh, I have had, when I was in uh, the position of provincial, uh, mostly the decisions were given without reasons. Um, whether a positive or negative decision will be given um, without an explanation of the reasons in the particular case. So when you... Reese, that's right. The recent matter that you've referred, you said that there's been a conviction, is that right? Yes. yes. That's a conviction for sexually assaulting a child? It is, yes. Um, would you have any expectation that Rome would say, other than, yes, this man must go from the ministry? Uh, well, I'm aware that uh, a number of um, cases haven't been uh, concluded in that way around the world. That there are... There's a conviction, but Rome doesn't take away their rights. Doesn't, doesn't laicise them. Yeah. yeah. I, I understand that's the case. Can you justify that to yourself? That's no, no uh, I believe that's not appropriate. The, the, well, what a bishop is able to do is to take away the, the faculties of the priest so that the person cannot act as a priest. Um, to uh, laicise um, is the next step, which is not within the competence of the local bishop. Um, but I, I would, my own personal view is that uh, have a conviction for uh, child abuse should uh, be met with laicisation. Have you had any discussions with other bishops or other senior clergy or religious about why Rome on occasion has not laicised a priest when they've been convicted of an offence against children? I haven't had much discussion about that. Um, it's a, uh, um, again, it's uh, not something that I'm, that I can really see the point of. But uh, and I, uh, so I haven't discussed it that much. Now, what have you done to understand why it is that clergy and religious? in not insignificant numbers, offended against children they met through their parish and other work, primarily in the 50s, 60s and 70s? Well, the re reading that I've done, I suppose, and also a certain amount of discussion with uh, other bishops, um, my view at this stage is that it's really a question of immaturity and... Um, and abuse of power. The person has sought to uh, find a position, and the priesthood, of course, uh, is a position that has access to a lot of people, including children. So a person who uh, is intending to offend uh, would be uh, looking to such a position, and a position that has a, a certain protection of uh, respect in the community. So. Those would be the elements um, that would draw a person who was looking to offend to the priesthood. Um, and then they, uh, um, their offences for some time uh, may be uh, covered by themselves, that they can, they can, I suppose, deceive people and... and and offend under cover of that position that they hold. Yeah. 
What you've just said could equally apply to a teacher, couldn't it? It couldn't, yes. Or a childcare worker. Yes. What is it, do you think, about the institution of the church that contributes to the offending of clergy and religious? Well, perhaps that, uh, that element of um, what respect is particularly, or was particularly strong within the church, um, maybe more than that in teachers or uh, childcare workers. Um, so that had built up over the years in the church community and that well may have made it less likely that people would challenge a priest. Did you uh, hear the evidence of uh, Associate Professor Quadrio the other day? I didn't hear it. I saw briefly a report about it only. Have you read any of the transcript of her evidence? I haven't yet, no. no. She gave evidence about why she believed the Catholic Church had been uh, the subject of so many claims and so, and so many offenders in this area of child sexual abuse. And she spoke about the hierarchy and the strict nature of how those within the church had to act. Now, what do you think of those as contributing factors? Uh, are you referring to the, what, the, like the system of government of the church? Well, the I'm not referring to anything. But, okay. Um, um, well, maybe I didn't catch the question then. Associate Professor Quadrio yes. was referring to the structure of the church yes. and the okay. hierarchical nature of the church mm -hmm. and the strictness with which people had to um, adhere to the rules of the church. Uh huh. Yes. Now, what do you say about that as contributing to sexual offending by priests and religious? Can you find it? I, I believe that could be taken then in two ways. Uh, um, if, if we uh, focus on the strictness of observing the rules of the church, people would not offend sexually. That's against the rules of the church then why have they offended in the numbers they have? I, I, as I said before, I, the, I felt the, I feel the, the profession provided a cover for those people. So it wasn't because they were following the rules of the church. It was because they used the church as a cover. Bishop, uh, you used the word respect, the yes. respect within, with which the priest was held. Do you mean by that? as a consequence of that respect, the power the priest had in relation to members of the congregation? I, that would be related to it, Your Honour. Uh, I was thinking more that of the um, respect leading to um, an unquestioning attitude of, about a person's behaviour. If someone is respected, then we presume they're doing good. Uh, yeah. Um, it's been said to us in private sessions that one of the issues was that the child being abused felt unable to tell anyone mm -hmm. that the priest was doing it because it was believed that, or the child believed, that no one would believe them. Mm -hmm. Priests mm -hmm. don't do those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Now, um, and, and others have said to us that the priest would actually use uh, reference to God um, as a means of manipulating the child mm -hmm. um, and abusing the child. Mm -hmm. and, and I assume you've heard of those sorts I have, of, yes. Well, yes. well what, what have you done and what has the church done to strip away this, um, as, if you like, mystique or um, respect or structure of power to ensure that children are able to say to adults, to their parents, the priest is doing the wrong thing. What have, what have you done about that? As bishop, I've tried from the beginning, that when I came, to, uh, to promote a, a way of serving people that is not lording it over them and try to promote uh, both in... Uh, amongst the priests and amongst the teachers in the schools, 
um, an openness to everyone so that everyone might feel able to, uh, to confide. Um, so that it's not, so that the way of acting is not one of, as we read in the gospel, of lording it over, but of serving. Uh, and what about the church in Australia? of which you're part, of course, and through the Bishops' Conference. Have, have these issues been discussed amongst the bishops? And is the church <coughs> recognising and doing something to break down this um, potential for abusive power relationships? I believe it's, um, it's quite a strong movement in the Bishops' Conference and the few years that I've been involved uh, to promote a sense of uh, serving in the diocese. Um, I would believe that in earlier years there, there was uh, a great good deal of uh, what, a sense of um, authority in a, an overbearing kind of way amongst some bishops and parish priests. Uh, but I believe, I haven't seen that uh, so much at all in recent years, um, and I think I think Your Honour quoted Pope Francis right at the beginning. I think he is certainly giving a lead in that regard. Yeah. There are others who have said to us that one of the issues for the church has been the um, minimisation or lack of input into the management processes of the church of women. Yes, yes. Do you understand that I do, yes. discussion now? What's yes. your view about that? I think that's correct, uh, that analysis. And uh, insofar as uh, I'm seeking to ad address that, um, I believe we have quite a good representation in the diocesan uh, organisation of women and their input um, and management or... Uh, um, care of all the different areas of the diocesan life. Um, in fact, so, in so many ways, uh, women take the lead. Yeah. It's suggested that the structure of the church, which doesn't ordain women in the way that others do, leads to a uh, perception amongst the men who are ordained uh, of a uh, uh, or distorted perception of their role. Mm -hmm. um, in society, uh, which leads some amongst those to abuse the power that that role gives them. Do you understand that? I, yes, I can follow that, yes. yes. Um, the remedy suggested by some is therefore women should play, take a full part in the church mm -hmm. and be ordained. What's mm -hmm. your view about that? Well, uh, essentially I, uh, I don't see scriptural uh, problems with that. Uh, uh, it's re basically, I think, within the Catholic Church, it's uh, it's the force of uh, basically 2,000 years of tradition, um, which would be rather yeah, slow in changing. I think it's. Uh, uh, yeah. I understand. I understand what you say there, but um, it, it, is it your view? It's a discussion which should be had when we look at the distortions that emerged. Is this a discussion that should be had? I believe that yes. If we see that as a uh, um, as a a difficulty in uh, um, having the church really uh, balanced as a community, then and you know with the with the recognition that perhaps in some cases that very imbalance in government was a contributing factor to some crimes even. Uh, if, we, if we follow that through, then that would be all the more reason. I would take perhaps a more positive view that, that the gifts of everyone should be developed. Um, but it, certainly if we looked at the possible negative effects of not including women, then that would add to the reason for discussion. Now we've been told by some priests, and, and it's emerged here in some of the discussions in this hearing, but there is considerable writing on this issue in Ireland and in America, that one of the problems which can lead to aberrant behaviour is that being a priest 
particularly in a rural diocese, can be a very lonely existence. Mm -hmm. Sure. Do you, do you acknowledge that it can be? I do, yes, it can be very lonely and that can be quite a problem. <clears throat> um, and what have you done to try and deal with that issue? Well, in the diocese we have regular meetings of priests and other parish workers. Um, I would encourage uh, the priests always to have um, good connections and with friends in, in the parishes and also beyond. And I do know in the Diocese of Ballarat, particularly as it seems to me in the more remote areas, the, the priests themselves do come together quite often um, socially, which uh, at least addresses in some regard that uh, problem of loneliness in more remote parishes. I think Mr. Ridsdale talked about the fact that the assistant priest had nothing much to do with the priest. Okay. Uh, and, and one sensed in his evidence this, the uh, hierarchical structure that Ms. Vanessa was talking about before. Um, in management, in many enterprises today, in government as well, a mentoring system is very often used to help develop people inside the organisation. Mm -hmm. Does that exist in the church? It does, anyhow, in the, my diocese. We've yep. got a number of uh, the older mm -hmm. priests, the more senior priests, who are mentoring um, the relatively newly ordained. It might even be up to about 10 years ordained. So they would meet with them on a regular basis. Um, they uh, the, would be the, pre the mentors, would be priests who uh, either uh, recently retired as parish priests or have been parish priests for quite a long time and that they would regularly meet with those who've been who are relatively new to the ministry to uh, talk over how things are going in their ministry with them. Yeah. Can I ask you to consider another subject that we have to consider, and that's the confessional. Mm -hmm. um, do you give confession? Do you? I do, confession? yes, yes. You do? Yes. And is that a regular occurrence for you or not? Uh, not so regular, not nearly so regular as it used to be. Uh, as a priest, especially as a redemptorist, I would be almost daily or every evening uh, with programs, with uh, confession as part of the program. But in my role as bishop, I tend to um, travel from parish to parish and not very often be uh, by hearing confessions. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what's your view about what should happen when someone confesses a crime to the priest? Should that priest be obliged to report to the authorities? I, my approach would be, I, my, I preface it by saying, I, like uh, Father McInerney, um, I believe that would be very rare, if not uh, never occurring. In my 40 years as a priest, uh, no one has ever confessed child abuse. I think Father McInerney made the same comment. But with that said, my approach would be um, that confession is meant to be a time for repentance and uh, honesty, so that the person, if they if they came to confess a child abuse, is confessing a sin against God and a crime against uh, people. Um, and part of the true honesty and repentance will be uh, facing the consequences of the law. So um, I would make that um, admission on their part uh, to the um, civil authorities part of their reconciliation so that they would be... How, how would you do that? What would you... What I would, would you require them uh, before I would... before giving absolution I would require that basically as part of the penance because I believe it's part of the honesty uh, facing the full impact of what they have done. Yeah. So you would say to that person, you must go to the authorities before I'll give you absolution. That's what my approach would be. And if they didn't go to the authorities? I wouldn't give them absolution. But uh, would you tell the authorities? I would have to think about that. Uh, the, what I'm trying to balance there is the, 
is the tradition or the, uh, the value of um, confidentiality which um, in regard to the confessional uh, for uh, the church's history has been treated as absolute. Um, we have heard, um, but it's not yet public, but we've heard from at least one priest who confessed to his confessor and in that way reconciled his offending behaviour, which continued with his belief in God. Um, that throws up a rather startling um, uh, illustration of um, how the confessional might be misused, doesn't it? It is. It would be a, a, a terrible, in my mind, a terrible misuse uh, because basically it lacks honesty. Um, it lacks sincerity um, because confession is meant to be conversion from offending, from doing wrong, to, uh, to taking up a new way of life. Um, and if it's such a serious matter as a crime, to treat it as though it were something that one could confess, I think, to me, that is simply a, uh, um, a shell of a ritual. It's not has no substance. Same phenomenon has been reported from Ireland. Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of that, no. no. <coughs> um, yes, yes, Ms. Venice. Bishop, uh, may I just Ooh. quickly follow on from the Chair's questioning and back to the confessional. Uh, the Royal Commission has also heard from adults who, as children, reported a crime against them in the confessional. What would be your attitude and what would you advise the priests in your parish to do in the case of a child presenting itself at a confessional and reporting a crime against them? So this is a child making a confession? A child yes. not confessing its no. crime, but mm -hmm. reporting in the confessional a crime against them? Oh, well, I... Yeah, I would feel that has to be followed up with, uh, uh, without, again, the uh, prohibition on revealing what is said in confession means that uh, a priest would not reveal, link their crime with a particular person, but that if, that, if a child has, uh, has spoken about being abused, that that has to be followed up by um, the for if it's a school group, for example, uh, the principal uh, and would need to follow that up um, uh, immediately. Bishop, Bishop this, it's not uncommon that people tell us that they themselves, when they were abused, felt that they were at fault, which lies behind the Commissioner's mm -hmm. observation that children have reported that they have told a confessor that someone was abusing them. Um, as the bishop, if someone, uh, some child, confessed that one of your priests was abusing that child, wouldn't you want to know straight away? I would, yes. Yeah, so, uh, wouldn't you want the confessor to tell you that a child has reported that Father X has abused them? Yes, I would, yes. And yeah. would, would the current position of the church enable the confessor to tell you that? Uh, well, it's, it's really, it's a person in the confessional talking about someone else. So it's, it's not, it's not the penitent confessing their sins. So it's, it's the child talking about someone else. So it's not, I don't see that as breaking the seal of confession. It's, it's, uh, it's not, in not the case where a person has come to confession, presumably with a confidence that this will be confidential, confess their sins, and then the priest talks about that. It's a child who's alerting the priest to a, uh, an offence that's, that's not actually being confessed in the confessional. Uh, so you'd expect the name of the abuser or alleged abuser to be communicated? Yes, if the child knew who they were, who was doing the offending, yes. Yeah. Yes. 
As you understand it, Bishop, the evidence before the Royal Commission from this hearing is that successive bishops effectively heard the confession of Ridsdale of his offending in the 60s, 70s and 80s outside the confessional and did nothing to stop him offending again, mm -hmm. indeed facilitated it by his moving from parish to parish. How did that happen? This has got nothing to do with the confessional. No, that's right. That's, uh, and so that's, if, a, if a priest or a bishop uh, heard of an offence uh, crime outside the confessional, there is no uh, restriction on them um, reporting that to the authorities. Yeah. Why did it happen that successive bishops in this diocese did nothing? The, you're referring to Bishop Mulkerns and... The previous bishop. Bishop O'Collins, okay. Uh, I couldn't say, uh, but I could, uh, couldn't say definitely, but uh, I would know of uh, Bishop Mulkerns having read some interviews that he had done, um, you know, that were done with him, that he considered um, wrongly, as we see now, that um, the priest could um, change. And so what he did was um, send the priest for treatment and counselling, counselling and whatever other treatment uh, might be proposed, um, but did not report the matter to the uh, police. Bishop, so, yeah. if that's what happened, what that means is the bishop only looked at the position of the priest and took out of the equation, left to one side, the consequences for the children who had been abused and for those who would be abused. Uh, yes, so from... And are we to understand that, in fact, that's the position the church was in? It was only looking at the welfare of its priests and not of the children. I thought the question, were, though, was about the, the re response to the priest. Uh, yeah. So that, that's I'll what it, it was. Again, well, I'll put it to you again. You, you say that the church believed that the priest could change and yes. therefore didn't take the priest out of service but moved him somewhere else yes. or had him treated. That means the church is looking at the position of the priest. But I'm asking you, what about the position of the children who had been abused and those who might be abused in the future? Where did they feature in the management process for the, for the church? Well, I, I recognise looking back on those uh, records from those years that that wasn't uh, there in the records, that there were, in the interviews, the focus was on what was done in relation to the priest. And was that the position of the church, at least in those times, to focus on the priest, but somehow manage to leave out of view the children? Well, certainly, uh, from what I've read in, from those interviews of Bishop Mulcairns, that's, that's what the focus was. Uh, it wasn't just limited to Bishop Mulcairns, but was it? That there was an overriding culture within the church in those years to protect the reputation of the church, to protect the reputation of an offender without regard to the effects on the children who were abused. There were, yeah, there were quite, quite a few um, cases where there seemed to have been... Um, the real focus was on um, what would happen in relation to the offender uh, and not, sadly, thought given those who have been hurt. Do you accept that in the 60s, 70s and 80s it was part of the culture of the church, not just individuals, the culture of the church to protect its reputation and the reputation of the offender over the interests of the children when such allegations were made? 
I don't know whether I'd say that that was a culture. It was certainly there were cases where that happened. Um, I would expect so would, that there were that bishops happened? who... Uh, just let me stop Sorry. you there. When you say where that happened... What you were referring to just now. I'm referring yeah. to the culture of the church. I'm not referring to individual cases and I'm not referring to individual bishops. Okay. I'm referring to a culture question. Well, it seems to me that a culture is made up of the contributions of all those individual people and how they act in a habitual kind of way. And I... I would see that some of the bishops uh, would have had uh, a very limited um, view of what needs to be done, um, but I, I'd have confidence that there were some bishops who had a, a much better view and were uh, more caring for those who had been hurt, as well as uh, their attention to the one who defended so that you together. don't accept that there was a culture in the church in previous decades to protect its reputation and that of alleged offenders over any form of disclosure or dealing justly with victims. So if uh, we look at maybe the predominance was that if we could say if that's what's meant by the culture, if that was the predominant response, then I would accept that, yeah. What has changed so that that is no longer the predominant response? The awareness of the impact of child abuse, I believe, is much stronger now um, is felt much more deeply um, so that um, the focus of attention, I believe rightly, is on um, the one who has been hurt and been abused, um, their family, um, and the other side, uh, if it's an allegation, uh, it's true that there still needs to be um, fairness in dealing with uh, someone who is accused, but I think the emphasis has changed to, the focus has changed to care for someone who has been abused. Um, and that's, um, that's a, quite a change, obviously, from, from a, a practice that would have... Um, essentially looked at um, what is needed in response to um, the accused. It's the, the one who has been offended against is, uh, I believe, more to the fore now in the, the church's thinking. Um, the Royal Commission has heard both in evidence in these hearings, but also in the various forums mm -hmm. that have been held in Ballarat, that it is a divided community, that there are families who no longer speak to members of the family, there are siblings who are estranged, and there are more broadly groups within the community who are at war with each other over the response they have to the history of child sexual abuse in this community. Now, do you accept that there is a divided community in Ballarat? Yes, there are quite a few divisions, I would say. Um, and people have sometimes quite different uh, reactions. Um, uh, some would be uh, those, of course, who would be directly um, hurt, those who, certainly those who have been defended against and their families. Um, would uh, really uh, feel the uh, crimes that have been done. Others who may be more distant from that uh, might not not see the the real the full impact or not appreciate it, and therefore they they would not uh, be 
in tune with thinking, I suppose, with the, uh, the, those who do appreciate the full impact. Bishop, yeah. it's been said to us that there is a need, not just in Ballarat, for the leaders of the church to tell the community that it's a good thing that those who've been abused come forward and tell of their abuse. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that? I do. Um, to repeat it, that the need is for the leaders of the church mm -hmm. to actually say to everyone in the community, it is a good thing for the church if these people come forward. Yes. Have you said that yourself? I have, no. yes. And do you believe that message has, as it were, got through? I don't know that it's got through. I, I would suspect it hasn't got through to everyone. Um, I've said it several times, uh, but I, I would need to say it, continue to say it, to, uh, because as I suggested just now, um, some people don't see that that's a good thing. They, they, they may, don't, may not see the extent of the need. Um, so I believe it's important that I give that lead um, just as an example, before the beginning of the hearings here, I wrote a letter to all the parishes which included some references on those lines that it is a good thing. That, as an example, the way um, survivors have given their stories here is a good thing there, and it's good for our whole community and it's good for our community of the church um, that um, these offences, these crimes, um, be recognised. Um, now, is your view on that, you do you believe, the view of the bishops through your interchange with them? I do. Is it yeah. the universal view of the bishops? I wouldn't have heard any dissenting view on that among the bishops, yeah. What more can you do as bishop to heal the rift in the community? I suppose uh, to give that message um, continually um, just by, by encouraging people um, by my own response to those who have been abused and encouragement to people to come forward. Have um, you conducted any forums or the like or community events Yes. that um, encourage the whole community to come together and um, talk about the issues that are at the forefront in Ballarat now? Uh, yes, not many. But we have one forum in, in uh, Ballarat and one forum in um, Warrnambool we conducted. What other tangible ways can you think of that you can heal the community? Healing the community is, as uh, I see, that's necessary in addition to the personal healing and the family healing. Um, but probably the, to the bishop is, uh, is um, the um, avenues of um, speaking with the people, the way that uh, I would address these issues myself. Uh, for example, uh, so weeks ago, uh, addressed in one particular parish, um, the sad history of that parish, um, and that um, recognises the pain in the parish, uh, not only of those who've been offended against directly, but the whole parish has had quite a history of... Uh, yeah, crimes committed there and by recognising that um, it may help the uh, as a step towards healing in the parish as opposed to recognise a problem is a step towards addressing a problem and may help to bring people together in some kind of a common understanding um, of uh, their parish's history What's the financial position of the um, diocese? It's um, 
not strong. Um, there will be many parishes um, that um, need to be subsidised. Um, the local parish may not have a large congregation. Some of the, the larger places, the larger parishes, uh, are able to um, subsidise the smaller ones and as well as making the contributions to the, the regular running of the diocese. Um, such as the general or the central diocesan offices, um, uh, whether that's in relation to uh, pastoral planning or communication. Um, so some of the some of the works of the diocese are done in a in a diocesan wide basis. The majority of the life of the diocese is parish based, and from the financial point of view, you would have some parishes that are. Um, reasonably well off, and but there'd be quite a lot that would need subsidy. The diocese as a whole would know the financial position of the diocese representing the various parishes, wouldn't it? Yes, the, so each parish has its own uh, financial position and the diocese, as distinct from the parishes, has its financial position, yeah. The uh, financial position of the diocese uh, includes holding various parcels of property? Very few, yes. And the property is <clears throat> held by way of a trust? Is that the case? That's correct, yes. In addition to the property trust or trusts, uh, is there something like a development fund? Yes, there is, uh, which is essentially a fund to which uh, uh, People will uh, contribute uh, something like uh, um, what uh, a, a central common um, way of sharing investments. So there'd be uh, a lot of uh, different investors who would put their money there. The idea being that by putting it towards the uh, uh, central investment fund of the diocese, um, that central investment fund is then able to offer at low rates, um, for example, for, uh, for school extensions and so on, so that the funding of um, activities of the diocese can be done um, without needing to, uh, to pay very high interest rates on the loans. How much money is in the development fund? Uh, for all from all the contributors, I would understand it's over a hundred million of, of, from all the contributors. And yeah. that development fund uh, is one that this diocese has access to. In in so far as the uh, the diocesan money is also one of the elements in the fund. Does anyone else have access to that money in that fund other than the diocese of Ballarat? Yes, obviously all the contributors, all those who put their money there, uh, they can withdraw their money at any time. Yeah. But there's no other diocese or part of church authority that is related to that fund? There's no other diocese, no, not related to the diocesan fund, no. And there are accounts from which general administrative uh, matters are related, I take it? That's correct, yes. Are yes. there any other accounts that the diocese has control of? I'm, uh, I'm aware that there are, there are accounts for, for the diocese and there are accounts for the parishes. That's, that's all uh, as far as I'm aware of. Uh, uh, some of them would be more specifically uh, targeted um, yeah, so for example, the, there's a bishop's ministry account which I can draw on for, for my petrol, for example. Uh, so there, there is, you might say, special purpose accounts. But, uh, and there's a yeah. foundation too, isn't there? A Catholic Diocese of Ballarat Foundation? That's correct, yes. And yes. how much money is in that foundation? I couldn't say offhand how much that is at the moment. That, but that is uh, a foundation set up um, precisely in order to to provide um, extra funds for activities of the diocese, yeah. Including the pastoral needs of uh, the parishes? Yes. And parishes? Yes. For example, if uh, 
uh, if a parish wished to, to set up, uh, as one did recently, um, services for, uh, for food for local people in need, they could apply to that foundation for the uh, for set-up funds for that. Yeah. Is uh, the diocese insured with Catholic Church insurances? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Where do the funds come from to settle claims of child sexual abuse? by offenders who were part of the church? If there is cover for the particular period uh, in question, then funds would come from Catholic Church insurance. If there's not cover, they would come from the general accumulated funds. Uh, sorry, they would come, in that case, from um, one of the uh, particular funds, um, which was really set up from a bequest um, many, many years ago, and that's been able to be drawn on for those specific uh, needs. How much money is in that fund? I think about a million dollars now. Was the bequest specific as to how the money should be spent? I, I don't know. I haven't seen the terms, um, but I'm presuming it wasn't. It was in the 1930s, um, and I'm presuming it wasn't uh, uh, specific. So in the event that a claim is made and there was no insurance cover at the time mm -hmm. or the insurer has uh, declined to um, pay out under the claim because of probably prior knowledge, uh, that claim is met by that fund. That's correct, yes. And if that fund is to be uh, extinguished in mm -hmm. the sense that all of the funds have been paid out in claims, where would the money come from? From the general accumulated funds of the diocese, um, which normally, uh, which they do, they, they, as invested, they provide like the annual income for the diocese largely. There's a small amount paid from parishes uh, to the diocese, but there is the bulk of the diocese's um, running costs as a diocese uh, are drawn from the interest on the accumulated funds of the diocese. Yeah. Has there been any work done within the diocese or by Catholic Church Insurance in relation to the diocese to understand what liability <coughs> in financial terms there might be of the diocese going forward for uh, historic and current claims? We have uh, thought about that, but uh, the finance committee that uh, that helps give advice, I think, uh, seems to uh, have come to the conclusion we really can't predict. Uh, I think auditors every year would uh, wish to be able to predict if they if we could foresee what. Well, those it's not a question of foreseeing; it's an actuarial um, right. episode, isn't it? That people do commonly in insurance terms have some sense based on current knowledge yes. about claims, work out how much they might need going forward. Certainly you can work out uh, and I presume estimate how much might that be needed. that exercise happened? It has. Uh, I'm not aware of conclusions of it, but I, th I would feel that the basic uh, message is that uh, we aren't able to be uh, very confident in the estimates. Have you undertaken that exercise to understand, on an estimated basis, what sort of money you're looking at in respect of claims arising from this diocese? Uh, yes, we've, yes, we've tried to do that. Uh, and do you have any doubt that you have sufficient funds to meet the claims that you understand from undertaking that exercise? I do have doubts that we could meet those claims. So yes. what have you done to ensure that there are going to be sufficient funds to meet the claims that you, based on your exercise, believe will occur? I've tried to be prudent in, uh, in uh, our spending and so that we don't... Uh, um, our funds don't uh, decline in other areas um, uh, so that, that we might have all... Prudent spending, do you think that'll be sufficient? I don't know that it will be. Uh, so what else have you thought of to ensure I that? I can't think of anything else to 
um, to, oh, it's always uh, a difficulty to, to uh, find sufficient funds for the, uh, the activities of the communities, and uh, including the church community. But if you have doubts that you could meet the claims that you believe might come based on the exercise you've undertaken, you must have done something to ensure that those claims which you think will be made will be met. I can't think of how I can do that. Uh, if, I, if, the, if the funds that we have at the moment um, are not going to be sufficient, uh, it may be that I would have to ask for help from other dioceses. Uh, well, that's one thing to do, isn't it, to it ask is. for help from other dioceses? It is. Has there been a discussion at the Bishops' Conference or in any other forum about the way in which dioceses can cooperate in the event that one has insufficient funds to meet claims in this area? I don't recall discussion on that point, but it is certainly a regular occurrence that the dioceses that are, don't have funds are subsidised from other dioceses. Would you expect that in the event you couldn't meet claims that you would be subsidised from another diocese? I would hope so. It's an, certainly an old Christian tradition that one community will help another. Yeah. Have you been in a position to seek subsidisation for any diocese for any purpose? I haven't, no. I have not have been able to give a little subsidy to some other dioceses. Uh, but not very much, but I have a little. Now, you'd understand, Bishop, that there has been an exercise by which the Royal Commission has sought to understand the data in respect of your diocese about claims. You understand that? Mm -hmm. And there's been discussions with those people who are effectively representing you today about that data. Do you understand that? Uh, in that you've been requesting data and we've been the analysis of the data, yes, certainly. Yeah. And that data tells us so far that um, concerning claims and substantiated complaints of child sexual abuse in the Catholic Ballarat region from January 1980 to, to date, effectively, that there have been at least 130 claims and substantiated complaints against the diocese for child sexual abuse, including seven claims which are jointly held with the Christian brothers. Mm -hmm. now, that's a figure that has been told to you, I take it? Yes, yes. And you accept that figure from the knowledge you have as bishop? Of, uh, yes, of the uh, records that I've seen, yes. And at least 14 diocesan priests of the Diocese of Ballarat have been the subject of one or more claims and substantiated complaints of child sexual abuse? I don't know that they're, they're all 14 have been substantiated. I said at least 14 diocesan priests. You don't accept that? That there have been claims against them, certainly. At but least. I don't know that they've been all substantiated. I'll repeat it for you. Sorry. At least 14 diocesan priests of this diocese have been the subject of one or more claims and substantiated complaints of child sexual abuse? I, I don't see the, uh, the, that you're including that all of them are substantiated. Well, the subject of one or more claim and substantiated complaint, effectively accepted complaint, if I use different language from what the data says. You don't accept that? I, I may be misunderstanding you, but I don't th think the, the, sub the substantiated point that you're making, that the, that the claims in all 14 cases are listed as substantiated. What do are you they? think the figure is? I'd have to check. I know uh, when the, F the Royal Commission certainly asked us um, early on that there were, there were six uh, priests that we looked at in particular, um, and then there certainly have been others, but I, I'm just questioning, uh, and I would have to look again at the figures, but I was thinking that in those 14, some of the 14, uh, the claims against them were not substantiated. Yeah. So what do you think the figure should be? Less than 14. Can yeah. you tell us how less maybe, than 14? Maybe uh, 12, uh, 10. Uh, uh, well, there will be more data to, um, to be 
tendered in the second hearing, so we'll, we'll certainly revisit the data yes, issue. Sure. Okay. Now, finally, the data from this diocese records that um, Mr Ridsdale has been the subject of at least 76 claims mm -hmm. and substantiated complaints spanning a period from the late 50s to the late 1980s. Mm -hmm. Do you accept that? Yes, I've seen those figures, yes. Mm -hmm. And we'll deal with the uh, monetary amount of those claims at the um, second hearing. Now, you say in your statement that um, you have been reopening uh, settlements that have uh, been made in the past. Mm -hmm. Yes. That exercise is primarily done by lawyers engaged by the diocese? It is in response to uh, claims that have come via lawyers, yes. yes certainly. Yes. So yes. Um, a, a complainant who has received a settlement mm. may come to the diocese, either individually or through a lawyer, and ask the diocese to reconsider the amount paid. That's yes. right? Yes. And there's lawyers that act on your behalf in respect of those matters? Yes. What instructions have you given to those lawyers about how they should go about considering the settlements? As the, the two questions that uh, come to mind about the reopening uh, really um, would come to how, whether the, uh, well, first of all, whether in the original settlement um, the uh, uh, person who made the claim was represented legally. If they weren't, then um, it needs to be remedied in this second time. What and, needs um, to be remedied? The, the le that they have legal representation in the second. So you, yeah. you would say to a complainant, you should get legal representation before we talk to you about reopening? No, no, I'm saying that um, if we're looking at the first settlement, and seeing if that was, um, uh, it needs to be um, uh, what reviewed, uh, needs to be revisited, then one of the elements of that is if there was no legal representation then, that would indicate it needs to be revisited. And the other element is the uh, settlement amount. If that amount was small, then also it's another reason for revisiting. What, by yeah. what criteria do you determine whether it was small? As by comparison with uh, perhaps the average, um, uh, the uh, average that we had paid, uh, as well as looking at the particular circumstances of the person um, who had made the claim at the time. So some, the, the range was quite large. Um, and if, if the payment first in the first settlement was below the average, then, uh, then that would be a sign that we need to look at that again. By average, do you mean average claims paid either by way of towards healing or litigation? Uh, the, well, both. Um, so it's the average having combined all claims paid, whether by towards healing, litigation or mediation between lawyers, all of those are averaged out. And then if the person seeking the settlement to be reopened was paid less than that amount, the starting position is it should be higher. Is that right? That, yes, that would be the, uh, um, a good... Starting point, yeah. Is it the case that um, the lawyers make a recommendation to you as to what should happen in response to a claimant wanting their claim reopened? They, yes, uh, they, they do make a recommendation. Um, we perhaps you'd say the sequence would be that. Uh, we would receive the claim um, and then from that point of on we're, we're discussing with our lawyers how it would be progressed and part of that is recommendations from the lawyers and uh, whether we 
follow that or whether we have our own uh, alternative. Mm. Um, In terms of the average, uh, do you look at a period of time over which you average the amount? I would... The, the, the ones that I have uh, been involved with would tend to look at the period of time when the first settlement was made and, and see what, what might have been the average, if you will, at that time. Yeah. And then do you compare the average today or do you just look at the average at the time that the initial claim was settled? Well, I would look at both, yeah. Because it'd be the case, wouldn't it, that those matters settled... Uh, in the 90s or early 2000s mm. would be lower than those settled in the current climate. Generally, with, even with inflation, uh, there it would be different. Well, but leaving aside inflation, the current climate ah, is yes. such that um, claims are generally uh, met with a higher payment yes. than in the past. Yes. So are we to understand that the average that you use is the average of claims made or paid at the time of the initial settlement or now? Uh, both. So that if the, mm. if the average was, for argument's sake, $30,000 when it was originally settled, and if the average now is $70,000 and the claim that they wanted now was over $30,000, how would you deal with that? Looking at, uh, so if it was, originally was paid, was the average, did you say? No. If the amount paid originally was above the average at the time. Oh, right, okay. But below the below current the average. Below the current average, well, I would be inclined to increase that, considering what would be a fair, or considered a fair um, redress nowadays. So fair by reference to what criteria? The uh, well, I suppose the substantial help to the person in, in particular needs that they have. You determine the amount to be paid now, assuming there's a claim for and to be reopened, based on partly the current average and where mm -hmm. the original claim fits, and the current needs of the person claiming. Yes. 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 And what instructions do you give to the lawyer as to how you should consider the current needs? For example, do you say you should take into account lost income, take into account uh, medical expenses, take into account the effects on secondary victims like the family? What instructions do you give them? I would uh, forward whatever material that we have uh, and usually in the course of the negotiating with the, the uh, other uh, lawyers, those um, documents that uh, outline those needs are provided. Consider those. In your understanding, whatever is put forward by the claimant to reflect their current needs would be taken into account? Yes, yes. Including anything they had to say about the effect on their partner, family, siblings, children? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Do you know that that is taken into account when settlements are reconsidered or are you just expecting that to be the case? I'm expecting if that's part of the explanation of the needs of the person making the claim that that will be considered. Have you discussed with your lawyers the extent to which you take into account um, what's usually described as secondary victims or family and the like? I don't believe that that's been uh, looked at very much. Uh, we uh, have had a couple of claims from secondary victims yeah, directly. Yeah. How so, have you so met those claims? Well, uh, responding in a similar way, um, although because we had not earlier had claims from secondary victims, we weren't able really to look back, as it were, on, on precedents there. Um, one gauge, perhaps, that I've thought to, uh, that could help, um, 
as a as a reference point um, is the uh, the state systems or the state arrangements for payments to victims of crimes, which could include um, family as well as the direct victim of crime. So I take it the answer is you do take into account secondary victims and make payment based on the view you take of the extent of the damage. Is that right? Yes, and giving what I would hope is a substantial help to that person uh, for their needs now. Uh, After a settlement has been reopened and a further amount um, considered and, let's say, paid, is there still access by that claimant to ongoing counselling through the Catholic Church, if they chose to do it, at no cost to them? There is. What, what other services are available to them that are ongoing after a settlement has been reached? They would really be uh, uh, kind of extensions of that uh, counselling type service. They might be medical, but some have been um, assistance or in fact payment of dental expenses. Um, beyond a settlement? Beyond the settlement, yes. So yes. you don't consider that after a matter has been paid and then reopened and paid again, that there will be no further payment of expenses leaving aside counselling? No, I, I would say that's a change in how I've looked at it uh, from earlier years. I did earlier tended to look at the uh, settlement in terms of a conclusion, but I have seen much more clearly that uh, what is called a settlement uh, may not uh, resolve. It may resolve for some people. It may be uh, sufficient. It may be really a uh, a, uh, a marker for them uh, that they are able to start a new chapter in their life, and they they perhaps have already come uh, to a point where they're able to uh, to be functioning well. If they don't need counselling. They've come to a better point in their life. But for others there are still ongoing expenses which are related to their earlier um, uh, crime against them. And uh, so the settlement, so-called, is, is not really the end of the help that's needed. Um, so I take it there's no question of uh, any claimant having to sign some sort of release that um, they won't take any further action against the diocese? That still is the case as far as the settlement goes, but it doesn't affect the availability of uh, funds for counselling or medical or other expenses. So claimants are now required to sign a release saying they won't take any further action against the diocese, are they? They are still, as far as I know, it's been the case for quite a few years. Has that yeah. been reconsidered in recent times? Not that I know of. Uh, you understand that other dioceses have reconsidered that and in some cases they no longer require a deed of release from a cl claimant? No, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, yeah. That hasn't come to your attention? No. no. Uh, you and I have nothing further. Bishop, um, when you took over as bishop, were you given a briefing about the uh, sexual assault issues in the diocese? I would say a brief briefing by uh, Bishop Connors, really. Uh, the, he, uh, he was very much aware when I remember our first um, interview with the local newspaper, I was speaking about the needs of education in the diocese and the different ele elements of parish life, and Bishop Connors spoke pretty much totally about the uh, uh, victims of sexual abuse and their families. Um, so it was very much to the fore in his mind and in the subsequent weeks we had, um, uh, I had a briefing from him about various elements of the, uh, the diocesan life including uh, a summary uh, basically of his approach um, to responding to complaints of abuse. He point you to where the files were? He did, yes, yes. Um, and what files did he point you to? 
well, both the personnel files and the files recording particular claims and or complaints. Does the bishop hold any secret files, as it were? Well, they're secret and they're, they're under lock and key, those two. Uh, yeah. No other files that are kept in a secret place? No, no. There are archives, which are, of course, that's a long history, uh, uh, so they're archives, but they're, they're really accessible um, for historical study, um, and the archivist is able to provide access to those. Um, Anyone else have any questions? I have a couple, if uh, no one else does, Your Honour. Yes, Mr Gray. I see the time, but Your Honour would... No, prefer... I think we might... Yes. If you've got a couple, we might as well finish. Okay? Yes, certainly. Um, the Catholic, the, the Diocesan Development Fund was mentioned, uh, Bishop. Is the money in the fund uh, made up of investments, that is, deposits to the fund by investors or depositors? It is, yes. yes. Um, and are those <coughs> investors or depositors... Uh, entitled to the return of their money when they require it? Yes, certainly. Yeah. So is the money in that fund, the development fund, available to the, to the diocese itself um, for the diocese to spend or use as it pleases? No, not at all. No, it belongs to the investors. Well, it's a bank, isn't it? It, it, works, isn't it? it, it works like a bank, yes. Yeah. doesn't have yes. all the features of a bank, but it works like a bank, yes. Effectively, the diocese can borrow from it and pay interest. Is that yes. Is that the way it goes? That's correct. So in that sense, the diocese does have access to it. The diocese can borrow, yes, just as other well, organisations can borrow, as we can from all borrow fund. from that fund, as well as from the banks, yes. 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 Now, yes. Bishop, um, do you have a consultors committee in your role as Bishop of Ballarat? I do, yes. And yes. you've been bishop since, I think, October 2012. Ah, uh, yes, yes. And uh, what is the role uh, in your time as Bishop of Ballarat of the Consultors Committee? We meet every two months. Um, probably most of the uh, role uh, is concerning either a general policy about uh, the diocese or particular appointments to parishes. Um, or, again, uh, it might be appointments of priests to parishes or it might be what provisions are being made in those parishes that don't have priests anymore and how they might be uh, ministered to, usually in that case by a small team of lay people. And what is the uh, obligation, if that's the word, of the bishop to uh, provide information to the consultors and conversely what... This is in your time. What is your practice in terms of obtaining information from the consultants? Well, I would rely on the consultants greatly. I'm relatively new to the diocese, and many of the consultants have been many, many years uh, priests of the diocese. So if it's, for example, a question of a, of a vacancy in a parish, I would rely on them to give their understanding of the needs of the parish. And if there is two or three applicants for the position of parish priest that they would give their understanding or their appreciation of the particular uh, qualities and gifts of that uh, those priests so we try to match the needs of the parish with the uh, with the priests um, but because I'm relatively new I've of course I know all the priests um, to some extent but the consultants often know them over a much longer period and after whatever discussion takes place, who makes the decision, the bishop or the committee? The bishop does, yes. And in your uh, time as bishop, are uh, such things, that is, appointments or moves of priests, put to a vote? No, they're not. In my time, no, they're not put to a vote. I go around the table, basically, and um, I'm pleased that the consultants are... Uh, they will readily express their opinions, so I listen to that. What usually happens then, um, I try to gather the, the, the uh, points that are made and what I know about the situation, and uh, I will then uh, perhaps have a further conversation with the uh, applicants and then make a decision. Yeah. Uh, if there was something known to you about... 
a priest who was either an applicant or a contender for a <clears throat> particular appointment, would you necessarily uh, make that information known to the consultants? Not necessarily, no. Um, well, I suppose I can think of an example. It might be a, a health issue with the priest. Uh, he said, perhaps he's advised me about it, but um, I know that, uh, that point, for example. I can weigh that up as I make my decision, but it's not necessary for me to, uh, to say that to all the consultants. Now, these days, certainly since you've been bishop in since 2012, uh, if you had any knowledge that any priest um, had offended against a child by way of sexual abuse, for example, I take it there'd be no question of him being appointed anywhere? No, no. Uh, what's... Uh, you were provincial of the Redemptorists for about four years or so before. Five years. Five, five years. years before yes. taking up this appointment. Uh, were you, did, was there a consultants committee in that role? There was. Um, and that was a somewhat different arrangement. It's, uh, I think, a long tradition in religious orders. There, is, uh, there was a, a group of two who were the ordinary consultants, and there was uh, two other members who were added to that group as the extraordinary council, and the typically division was that personnel matters uh, were looked at by the small group, and the larger group would look at general policy matters. Yeah. And what about before you were uh, the provincial of the Redemptorists, but in your earlier various roles within your order, uh, were you ever a consultant yourself? Quite a few times, yes. At various, and you said you've been a priest for about 40 years. Now, are you able to assist the Commission at all in terms of any differences of approach of bishops in your experience between the present era, including your own time as Ballarat, and earlier periods in those 40 years going back to the 1970s? Well, I suppose one, one difference uh, I would see, generally, it would be m more consultation, more asking opinions these than, days. Than these days than used to be the case. Uh, if it's possible for you to say, speaking generally, what's your understanding of how bishops typically uh, ran their dioceses and ran their consultors' committees in the 1970s and 80s? I, my impression was that the bishop uh, would more um, frequently uh, um, make the decision without a lot of consultation, whereas now there would be the more of a practice that there would be more consultation. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Bishop. What do you mean by that? Uh, do you mean the bishop didn't consult? Not or as much as today. Not, no, yeah. What do you mean by not as much? Well, I mean, uh, on, on did, they meet? did they meet, first of all? Did they meet? They did meet. Did uh, they talk about the person who might be appointed? Uh, they may have, uh, or it may have been more of a formality uh, on as far as the appointments go, because the law didn't strictly require the bishop to do that. Yes. He was required to uh, consult on the financial matters if there was uh, some expenditure. But if you have a set of minutes that reveal that appointments have been recommended and decisions have been made from a consultant's meeting, does that tell you that they chatted about the individual appointments? Well, it says that that was on the agenda, oh. anyhow. Well, yes. Doesn't that mean that it was talked about? Yes, probably. Talk, yeah, you would say so, that, that the bishop may, to some extent, have asked their opinions about those things. Yes. Yes, very well. If I show you two minutes, first of all, tab 11 of uh, the tender bundle that we were going through yesterday. <coughs> This is a minute from January 19, 
1976 in this diocese when of course you were not present. There are some remarks at the beginning of the minute which read as follows. After stressing again the confidentiality of all matters dealt with in consultors' meetings, Bishop Mulcairns announced that some matters had arisen in the diocese which might make it advisable to delay making many appointments. You see that? I do, yes. yes. Now, reading that minute from 1976, uh, are you able to assist the Commission as to whether that, in your experience, um, as a priest over that 40-year period, uh, that indicates that um, the bishop would have said or would have been likely to say what it was that he was referring to? As, as I read such a minute, it, it, it could be that. Uh, it, uh, it could, as it says there, it's after stressing again the confidentiality of all matters dealt with in consultors' meetings, the bishop announced that. So it's, it reads to me as though the bishop had made a decision um, Bishop, uh, as far as matters had arisen. Bishop, yes, let's break it into two parts. Yes, After stressing again the confidentiality, yes, now that must mean the Bishop was going to disclose things that had to be kept confidential, mustn't it? Yes. So there's no other way yes. of reading that. And thus you can assume, can't you, that the Bishop has told the consultants what he knew that was to be kept confidential. And that's the second part of that statement. Yes, and uh, that's true. So that there was, uh, in this case, a, a stress on the confidentiality. What, what was, uh, uh, to what extent uh, he explained what was the, uh, what was the basis of the confidentiality or the matter to be kept confidential um, is uh, not clear to me from that. No, it's not clear, but if, if it was sexual problems, mm -hmm. you don't need to say much more than, than that, do you, to realise what's going on? So, certainly, if, so if, let's say, the bishop had said that there is a sexual problem uh, with regard to one of the priests, um, and I stress the confidentiality, it means that the consultors are reminded not to, not to uh, speak about the fact that... Um, there have been um, concerns over sexual matters of a, uh, a priest. Yes. Thank you, Ron. Mm. Yes, anyone else? Any questions? Question? Oh, you're on. No. Just a couple of matters. Oh, pardon. Just a couple of matters, Bishop. Can I just take you back to the questions and answers with respect to um, your... Uh, answers about trying to help heal divisions in the community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you've given us um, your response to what um, you personally have done. Um, do you also consider that you have a role to play with respect to giving the priests in the diocese guidance about what they should be doing too? Uh, yes, I do. Um... From that point of view, actually, uh, I also feel I have a role of learning from them because quite a number have uh, done a good deal, I believe, over many years in trying to heal um, divisions within parishes. Uh, so both I do have a role to, to give guidance, but uh, I also feel I've learned from them. And are you, in terms of the reference to the word divisions, are you referring to divisions inside families and inside congregations? I'd be probably more aware of divisions inside congregations with different members of a local congregation having very different views about, um, say, the extent of the child abuse problem or the, the way that people should respond. Uh, I'm also, though, aware that uh, the child abuse has caused um, divisions within families. 
So just with respect to the divisions within families, what's your understanding of what's being done by the parish priests in that regard? I'd see the parish priest's um, very important role is somehow to be a uniting kind of figure, a person. So if the parish priest is able, say, to be in touch with the different members of the family, he may be able to provide some uh, help in some reconciliation uh, between them. So in a sense, to act as something of a mediator between the members of families. And are you aware as to whether or not that is actually being done? I've heard of, of some uh, cases in earlier years where priests, I believe, have been um, helpful in that regard. But I'm not current. I'm not currently aware of any families that are that are being helped in that regard. Uh, is that something that you've spoken about with parish priests? Uh, I've talked about it with them in our our meetings because it is a is a problem with um, many of the parishes because there have been so many parishes where there have been <coughs> abuse and therefore the consequences continue on. Yeah. And with respect to congregations, what what do you understand that parish priests are doing with respect to healing rifts inside the congregations? Again, I think their role is the same, to try to be in, uh, in touch personally with all their congregation and in that way to be something of a mediator between different groups. Um, it may be that special events, even such as a, a prayer time for those who've uh, suffered abuse and, and families can be a, a unifying time. It may be one of the exam experiences we had uh, um, last year was a particular week where we did have prayers in a number of parishes um, and they were essentially prayers of lament that these crimes had been committed. And if you go, if we go right down to that point, then everyone is able to join in that lamenting. Um, it's maybe it's a deeper point than what particular response is to be made here and now, but it's uh, something which may help to unite the whole parish if they're able to pray um, together about um, the abuse that's happened. What about uh, leadership from the pulpit? Some of the priests um, have, I believe, given quite good leadership in helping people um, appreciate the impact of abuse and in that way helping the people of the parish have uh, by their sermons, helping the people of the parish have a common understanding. And that, I think, will help to, to uh, um, overcome divisions. Are you yeah. encouraging the priests to do that? I will encourage them more. I have, uh, not to a large extent. In fact, I've only myself started uh, to speak uh, more directly from the pulpit about uh, the abuse in more recent times. Uh, I've written earlier times, I haven't spoken so much, and, but I would encourage priests, um, some uh, will find it easier to do, but I think for everyone to at least uh, address the issue at some stages from the pulpit um, is helpful for the parish. Yeah. Do you mean to convey that there may be some reluctance from some of the priests to do that? Yes, and I think and often enough it may be from a sense of not knowing what to say. Um, That's a, a role that you can assist them with, isn't I it? I would hope so, yes, yes. And just um, one, final, one final issue that um, comes back to a matter that was raised by Commissioner Murray with you about a, um, a child making effectively making a disclosure mm -hmm. in the confessional. Mm -hmm. um, do you 
Uh, are you aware of any current instruction to parish priests um, as to what to do in such circumstances? No, I, we have quite a, uh, I believe, quite a full uh, document as far as uh, steps to be taken if for any disclosure, but actually we, we didn't refer in that uh, to the particular circumstance of confession, but I would see that essentially the same steps would be taken wherever the disclosure was made, whether it was uh, in a schoolroom or whether it was in the, in the confessional or in... Uh, um, home, wherever it was made. <clears throat> now, I understand, though, that you're expressing a personal view about what you would do, but I'm asking you a different question about whether or not there's instruction at the moment. There's no, as, and I understand you to say, there's no current instruction being given to priests about what to do in those circumstances. No, I, I was referring to our code of conduct from the, for the diocese. And, and that just gives the instruction about when a complaint is made or when a disclosure is made, uh, what steps would be taken, but it doesn't actually say where uh, or in what circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you may have been referring to a higher instruction. I'm not sure whether you meant the instructions in the diocese. Well, I'm uh, asking you simply to um, to what would happen in your diocese, diocese. with respect to your... The priest Sunday. Your okay. Leadership. Yes. Well, I th perhaps uh, thank you for that. I I may need to make it clearer that those rules. Well, we've made it clear in general that that all the procedures in our code of conduct apply throughout the diocese in all circumstances. But we may need to make it clearer that that includes um, wherever a disclosure is made. Yeah. Bishop, you. Uh said to Justice Cote that some of your priests may not know what to say. Mm -hmm. What should they say? As far as encouraging uh, those who have been uh, abused to come forward, that would be one element of what they should say. Um, expressing um, sorrow for uh, the crimes committed against them, expressing a hope that the community will be uh, supportive of them and their families. These would be some things, I believe, that would be good to say. Ms. Finnis. Nothing further, Your Honour. Yes, thank you, um, Bishop. Thank you for your evidence. You are excused. Thank you, Your Honour. And Ms. Finnis, where do we go from there? Uh, Your Honour, there's no further witnesses in this first hearing in Ballarat. Uh, the Royal Commission will be returning towards the end of the year, and when a date is fixed, it will be communicated. The, uh, in the meantime, there are several lines of inquiry that the Royal Commission has to um, undergo, and the investigations that um, began some time ago are still... Uh, being conducted. Very well. Well, we'll adjourn to a date to be fixed. Thank you, Your Honour. Yes. All stand. Thank you, Your Honours.